So when I was 22 years old, I joined a cult. Everything I'm gonna go over in this video today is lessons I've learned from CEOs, from founders of companies, from leaders that I have been led by, as well as my experience in leadership as well. So first and foremost, you're a leader. It does not matter the organization, the platform, or the team, someone looks up to you. Someone follows your message. Even if you're just like an influencer or a content creator, you have followers. These people subscribe to the narrative that you believe in, and this is gonna help you out regardless of your industry. There's no such thing as bad teams, only bad leaders. This is a quote from Jacko Willink's book, Extreme Ownership. A fundamental flaw in leadership is how many times have you had a boss or a coach where they preach these principles, but they don't live by them? You don't want to follow them. No one follows a hypocrite, right? That's, that's just the way the world works. You need to be doing and living your life by the principles that you teach. And this is a fundamental flaw that I made. When I first transitioned into a leadership role, I remember I was telling everyone, hey, we need to wake up at six. We crush the gym. We're working by nine. We don't come back till it's dark. But I wasn't waking up at six myself. And what do you think happened? I'm the example. When you're a leader, you are the example because subordinates will do 20% of what you say and 80% of what you do. So when I came down in the morning and I was getting up at 7, 7.30, I was a hypocrite and I lost so much respect in terms of being a leader. I remember it to this day, it hurt that bad and it called me out and it made me get on my shit. No one likes the king who watches the battle. They follow the king on the front lines. This is so true. Think of Game of Thrones. Like, who was the number one guy that everyone liked? It was Jon Snow. Why? Because he was out there, dude. He was in the trenches. People had so much respect for him. He led the battle himself. Even if there was no one around him. Like that one moment in Battle of the Bastards, no one's behind him, but he still fights the fight. And that's how I want you to think of leadership, is no one will follow you if you're a hypocrite. Because your style of leadership will condition others to lead the same way. Leadership is a hierarchy, right? It may start with you. You might be somewhere in the middle. It does not matter. The people below you will essentially look at you as their example because to them, you are their leader and they will lead in a similar fashion. Meaning if your leadership style is absolutely crippled, it's only a matter of time before, you know, the house of cards falls down. That's why these topics are so important. If you're a coach and you don't actually, you know, physically do the thing that you teach, you need to live by the principles that you preach. This is so overlooked in leadership. No one will follow a hypocrite. You need to live by the principles that you teach. It does not matter your industry. Communication is critical. You should be telling people what they need to hear and not what they want to hear. Think of it like this. If you let the conversation with you and a team member go unspoken and you never address the issue, that is like a cancer. And that will spread to subordinates to the point where the house of cards completely collapses. You need to to address these issues because give bad habits an inch and they'll take a mile. Like we've had times where, you know, we brought in people to the organization, part of the team, and they weren't really a good fit. You know, there were conversations that we were supposed to have that we didn't, and it's our fault. You know, that was on us. We didn't address the fact that these guys were going out way too late. They were partying way too much. They were setting a bad example. And like I said in the previous slide, it's a hierarchy. It's, it's a complete hierarchy. So you need to make sure the message goes to the right person and there's no gossip. You don't want to be the type of person who says, oh, yeah, did you see what Jim's doing, dude? Frick Jim, all the stupid shit he's doing, you know, drinking, smoking, spending all his money, all that stuff. You need to make sure the message goes to the right person. You need to have a conversation with that guy, with that girl, and to them only. You need to make sure the message goes to the right person. And another thing that's extremely overlooked in leadership is being vulnerable with the team. You need to be vulnerable. That creates a bond. Some of the best leaders I know, I know their deepest fears. And I think that's important. I remember there was this powerful exercise. We all got around a fire and we wrote on a piece of paper what our deepest fear was. And this, this was in business, right? We wrote our deepest fears. And we were all around a fire. We read them off and then we threw them into the fire. And we were vulnerable. People cried over this shit, dude. But because of this, since we were vulnerable with the team, we were strong against the world. The team's problems are your problems. As a leader, people are going to come to you with issues that are personal. And almost all problems are personal, and it's a leader's job to help solve them. That's just how it is. You get a lot of trauma dump. You know, I remember when I was 
newer in the game of business, I would go to my leader and I would just, you know, tell him what's going on. Oh, dude, this sucks. This is terrible. And I would just vent all this stuff to him. And he had to lead 10 other guys who had a similar, you know, feeling as me. They had their own problems that they were going through. And as a leader, it's a bearing task. Leadership is this glorified role. And it's extremely taxing, dude. I've seen leadership crumble more people than I've seen it help ascend. And another fundamental flaw in leadership is a lot of people call people out, right? They just call them out. You need to work harder, right? And that's good if it's behind closed doors. But a better way to do this, in my experience, has been to call people up. If I genuinely look at a guy and I know he's an A player and he's performing to a C player level, I'm going to call him up. I'm going to say, look, bro, I know you're capable than way more what you're doing. You don't have to do this for me, but you got to do it for yourself and the people that are on this team because they look up to you. That's calling someone up, not calling someone out, saying, look, you're sucking ass. No one wants to be talked to like that. It's just a bad style of leadership. And behind closed doors in a one-on-one conversation, can it go like that sometimes? Yes. Sometimes that's a painful conversation that needs to happen. But if you call people up in front of the team, it inspires everyone, bro. And it's really good for the culture. And allow subordinates to provide feedback. One of the greatest things that we ever did, at the end of the week, we would get together in one-on-ones, right? Where they would get together with their leader and they would talk to him. They would just say, you know, ask him about the day, ask him about the week, how everything's going. And then at the end, they would ask, what is one thing that I can improve on as a leader? It's one of the best ways to level up a, you know, even a business, even a product, a service, but especially with leadership. Just provide feedback get feedback from subordinates and let them speak you know if you're in more of a corporate culture or whatever it may be in a team setting allow subordinates to speak first because if you're a leader and you talk first the subordinate's gonna bite his tongue that's just that's kind of how it works he's like oh well he already talked i don't want to talk let them talk first because then they won't mince their words they won't hold anything back and you can get the true message and you get feedback to improve your leadership This is a tough one for most people to swallow. Never take the credit, always take the blame. I can't tell you how important this is. You know, one of the best leaders I've ever met in my life, his name's Ryan Tester, incredible guy. He's the type of person, I swear, if he told me we need to go to war, I would ask one. Like, he is that good of a leader. And he wouldn't take the credit, but he would always take the blame. And when you have a system in a leadership hierarchy like this, the accountability that, you know, you live by, it trickles down, right? If we missed a target, right? Let's say we had a revenue target, a sales target. We miss it. And you say as a leader, guys, that's on me. I didn't do everything I should have. We should have been training more and I should have been the one leading those trainings. That's on me. You'll notice people will speak up. They'll say, oh no, man, that's on me. I wasn't working as much as I should have this month. You know, I was slacking off. I was distracted. And then someone else is going to speak up. Because remember, as a leader, you are the example. And on the flip side, when you give credit to others, people want their, their efforts to go recognized. And this is going to increase performance. You know, if you hit the goal, or even if you don't hit the goal, whatever. If you say, you know, look, guys, we did great this month but you guys absolutely crushed it. You know, Jim, you went above and beyond. You absolutely crushed your target. Like round of applause for Jim. That inspires him. He's like, dude, I've been busting my ass and it gets recognized. He gets the dopamine hit for it. And the only way he gets that dopamine hit is if he does it again. No one likes the leader on the flip side when they're like, you know, they hit their target and they just say, oh yeah, yeah, it's on me. I've been busting my ass, you know, working super hard. You know, I I deserve this. No one wants to follow that person. People want their efforts to be recognized because no one wants to produce without recognition, right? And if you want a high high performing team, you got to make sure you recognize those efforts. It's extremely important. Strong leadership gate keeps low performers. So when standards are high and exemplified by leaders, low performers have to adapt or quit. This is a great... Essentially, it's like a, you know, like a funnel, right? I like to think of it when people go mining for gold, right? They had that mesh sheet where they would shake it and then whatever would stay, you know, above the mesh guard was gold and whatever would go below was junk. That's kind of how it like, that's kind of how it is in leadership. 
you want to make sure you weed out the low performers. And a great way to do this is when you have high standards and you live by them. I remember when we had people who were just underperforming, we didn't even have to tell them to leave. Like they just packed up their stuff, they quit. That's how it was. Because we were performing at such a high level, you know, and bringing people up and they weren't meant to be a part of that team. That that was a mistake on our end for recruiting them in the first place. But it gatekeeps low performers. They just leave. They can't keep up. It's too intense. It's too much. And this forms a strong culture. Culture is the layer one brick of a great team, of great business, of a great organization. Your culture is your future. If you have high standards and you exemplify them, you have leaders leading from the front, you're calling people up, you're vulnerable with the team so you're strong against the world, you play a winning game. I can't tell you how many times I've been the mistake being in a leadership role where I play to not lose. Right, where it's like, oh, dude, I just really hope we don't you know, miss our target. And it's like a fear-based approach. That sucks. That's not what you want, especially because it, it shows weakness in a bad way. You want to play, play to win. That's the frame that you need to have as a leader. You know, we're going to win. We're going to hit this goal. We're going to do whatever it takes. No matter the sacrifice, no matter what we have to go through, we will hit this goal. And when you have a culture like that too, one of the most important things is you need to lead with love. It's going to sound fruity, but it's like, it's like in war movies, dude. The person, the soldier performs to the highest level for the person next to him. And that's how it was. You know, when I said at the beginning, I was a part of a cult. That's literally how it was. You know, there were days I didn't want to wake up. There were days I didn't want to do the work. I didn't want to take the calls, but I had to perform for the person next to me because we had a goal. We were a unified team. Most teams aren't teams. There's just a bunch of people in a group. When you lead with love, when you're close, when you're vulnerable with the team, and you genuinely care about the person next to you and their success, and it's literally you versus the world, it is it is us versus them, you have a completely different level of team. And that's a frame that you need to have. You know, when I said at the beginning I joined a cult, we're going to get in that in a sec, but just, just hold on to that thought. This, this right here is biblical, literally. Where there is no vision, the people shall perish. This comes straight out of the Bible. You must believe that your fight is the fight of a lifetime, whatever you're doing. If you're going for a trophy, if you're going for a revenue goal, you're going for a sales target, it does not matter. You need to believe in your soul as a leader that this is the fight of a lifetime, that you are literally destined to participate in this fight. That's how it should feel. And when I said earlier about the us versus them mentality, it's a good thing. Like when people say cult, it's got a bad stigma behind it. I get it. But that's the only way I can describe like, you know, that type of bond with teammates is it's literally to the point where we can't sympathize with outsiders. We can't, we don't understand. We genuinely don't understand what their frame of mind is. You know, I remember on the sales team, we, we couldn't understand people who weren't trying to make 20, 30K a month, how they could sleep at night, how they could, you know, skip the work, how they could go out, drink, party, do all this stuff and just ignore the ugly reality. We could not relate to that. It was a us versus them. We were crazy, absolutely nuts. But the reason why that's so important is your conviction will be tested by doubters. I've had this time and time again where you have a principle and a subordinate in the group will question it. Right? Like, why do we have to do this though? You know, why do we have to stay out till dark? Why do we have to train? And it's a test. And if you fold to that test, your culture decreases. 90% of the time, when this happens, when that conversation comes up, it means that you're not living by the principle. That's the truth. That, that's how it works in my life. When I would get questions about, you know, a certain philosophy or a principle or a tactic that we would use, and I wasn't abiding by that principle wholeheartedly, that's when those conversations would come up. That's when you get, oh, why do we have to do this? Because you can't be convicted in something that you're not actively doing. No one will follow a hypocrite. You need, in your heart of hearts, to believe that your fight is the purpose. Whatever you're doing, whatever the goal is, end of the year, end of the month, it does not matter. You have to like realize this for what it is. This battle that you are in right now 
is the most important battle you have faced up until this point. That's the frame of mind. And you don't, you don't understand really what's going on with outsiders. That's how strong your culture has to be. And like I said earlier, it, it's, it's like a cult. It is. But because of that, when I was led by that style of leadership, I literally wanted to follow this guy into war. And it helped me. It was a beneficial act. It wasn't like, a, you know, this, this thing where the actions or the goals we were participating in were, were detrimental. They weren't. They helped our lives. It's just our brotherhood, the camaraderie we had, the culture we had was so strong to the point where the only word in the English dictionary I can use to conceptualize it was cult. So if you're looking to get around people who see it the same way you do, community is going to be the first link in the description below. Take care.